You're listening to the Redeemer Church Podcast. To learn more about Redeemer Church, including our gathering times in Ponte Vedra Beach, Florida, visit us online at RedeemerPV.com. Today's sermon comes from Pastor Sean Yost. Well, as I mentioned earlier at the beginning of the service, today is Pentecost Sunday, and we're going to talk a little bit more about that in just a moment, but would you stand with me for the reading of the word today? It's going to be a little bit of a lengthy passage. It's from Acts chapter 2, and it is specifically about this Sunday, Pentecost Sunday. Acts chapter 2, beginning with verse 1. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like a blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest over each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now there were staying in Jerusalem God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. And when they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard in their own language what was being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, aren't all of these who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in our own native language? Then Peter stood up with the 11, raised his voice and addressed the crowd, fellow Jews and all who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken of by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they will prophesy. I will show you wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming and great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Now they were, now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, repent. And be baptized, each one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off. Everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. And with many other words, he bore witness and continued to exhort them saying, save yourselves from this crooked generation. So those who received his word were baptized. And there were added that day about 3,000 souls. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. We've been in a three-part series based on Martin Luther's small catechism. In 1517, Martin Luther nailed his 95 thesis to the Wittenberg door, setting off a chain of events that became known as the Protestant Reformation. His understanding of justification by faith and the priesthood of all believers have continued to influence the church for hundreds of years. And as people began to grow and gain in their understanding of this, he created the small catechism to make it available to the average person. In the beginning of his small catechism, before we even get into what it means to be a disciple, the starting place is these three things, above all things. To fear God above all things. To love God above all things. And then today we're looking at to trust God above all things. And then from there, he gets into what it means to grow as a disciple and to live out our faith. So we're looking at this today. What does it mean to trust God above all things? Trust is putting our faith and reliance in God alone. Trust is to place confidence in, depend on, to keep, uh, to place, to commit or place in one's care for keeping. The story of the Bible is the story of God trying to build an unshakable trust and confidence and faith in him. In the beginning, the break with God was all about a lack of trust. So the serpent comes in and he begins to plant seeds of doubt. This is how it works. Plant seeds of doubt so that we mistrust God. So he says to Adam and Eve, did God really say don't eat of all these trees? And they said, no, no, God didn't say that. He said, just don't eat of this one. Hmm. 
Why did God say that? What is God holding out on you? God's holding out on you. He doesn't want you to eat of that tree because, and he plants the seed of doubt. That doubt becomes the lack of trust that causes the break in relationship. And then in the Old Testament, God creates the nation of Israel. And one of the reasons was to show the rest of the world what it is like to be in relationship with God. In fact, that's what today is the fulfillment of. So 50 days after Passover, God delivers Egypt out of Israel. That's Israel out of Egypt. That's Passover. 50 days after that, Moses is on Mount Sinai as a revelation of God's holiness and the giving of the law. And this is the birth of Israel. It's called Shavuot. 50 days after Passover is Shavuot. The revelation of God's holiness, the giving of the law, the birth of Israel. On Shavuot, 3,000 people died. Now, Jesus is the fulfillment of Passover. He is our Passover lamb. 50 days after Jesus is crucified on Passover is Shavuot, what we call now Pentecost. And it's the revelation of God's grace the giving of the Holy Spirit and the birth of the church. That's what this is all about. And on that day, 3,000 people are saved. You see how God brings all this together? But even before God brings this revelation to Israel and before, he, he, and before they have this birth as a nation, is he delivers them out of Egypt. So he delivers them out of Egypt and then he tells them, now this is how... I want you to live, not so that we can be in relationship, but because we already have one. God already established his relationship with Israel when he brought them out of Egypt. And now he's saying to them, now you know this is, I am the one who brought you out of Egypt. Now here's how I want you to live. God desires to be in relationship with us. God desires to be in relationship with you, with each one of you. And just like a lack of trust broke the relationship with God in the garden, a realignment of trust, an act of trust will reestablish that relationship with him. As we just read, anyone who calls on the name of the Lord, who places their trust in him will be saved. But it is a challenge to continue to put our trust in God. It's easy to say trust in God, and it's easy to trust God when everything is going well. But it's more challenging to continue to put our, I like it when you talk to me, by the way, whoever that was, that was helpful. Jesus says this in John 14, do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust God, trust also in me. Jesus is saying, look, I know it's gonna be tough at times. There's gonna be crazy things happening around the world. Don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust God, trust also in me. In fact, later on in John 16, he says this, I've said these things to you so that you may have peace. In this world, you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. So he's saying, put your trust in me. It's, it's easy to trust when everything is going well, right? Bank account looks good. Everybody's liking you. You know, you, all your social media posts, everybody likes it and loves it, likes it and loves it. It's a lot harder to put your trust in God when the bank account's not looking so good and people are mad at you and you get those emails. It's a lot harder when you're facing real difficult circumstances to continue to put our faith and trust in him. We live in a fallen world all of us have experienced broken trust. See, at the root of all trust issues, now listen to this, at the root of all trust issues is a past betrayal or a fear of betrayal. And so it makes it hard. And so we, we, we've had these things happen in our life and so it makes it hard to trust. It makes it really hard to trust God. Years ago, uh, when I was a youth pastor, actually, I'm still a youth pastor. I'm just kind of in disguise as a lead pastor. But my heart is still teenagers and kids. I love it. But when I was a youth pastor, there was a girl in our youth group, and I don't know why I, I did this. She came to church one Sunday, and I was, say, I was talking to somebody else, but I reached out to like hold my hand so she could like slap it. And right when she went to slap it, I moved it. And then I laughed, and she was like, oh, you know. And then next Sunday, I saw her, and I did it again. 
And then the third Sunday, I went to put my hand out again. And this time she said, no, I don't trust you. I felt it. Like here, I'm trying to have a good time. And what I actually did is, I mean, I broke her trust. And I tried to really earn her trust back after that because I felt so bad. But it, it, that's what happens is we, we, at the root of all trust issues is a past betrayal of some kind. Our kids, when they were small, I love to play with our kids. And we have three kids, they're all grown. I've got three grandkids and another one on the way. And I used to love to always play with them and they'd get on the floor. And when Josiah, he's now 23, when he was our youngest, and he would go crawling away and I would grab his leg and drag him back. And then I'd let him go, make him think he's getting away again. And just when he got to grab his leg and pull him back, and then I would lift him up in one air and hang him upside down. And one day Barb walked in the room, saw me doing that. She goes, what are you doing? I'm like, I'm teaching him to trust me. She's like, no, you're not. You're teaching him not to trust you. I'm like, oh, okay, I'll put him down. And so now I play that game with our granddaughters, but I don't lift them up. I just, you know. And I don't know, I don't know if my plan worked or backfired. It kind of backfired a little bit uh, because now he's not afraid of things that he should be afraid of. So when he turned 13, you know, when our kids turned 13, we like go away to have like a weekend together and, you know, just talk about what it means to be a man or Barb to talk about with, you know, with Lydia, what it means to become a woman of God. And I was doing this with Joe and like, okay, we're going to plan something fun. So we get down to central Florida to do like extreme things like, you know, um, bungee jumping and zip lining and all this stuff. And I was asking Joe, I was like, did you have a good time? Was that awesome? He goes, yeah, but it really didn't scare me. I'm like, was that the goal was to scare you? I'm like, okay. So we decided on the way back, we're going to stop in Orlando at this sky coaster. Sky Coaster is, if you've seen this on I-4, or no, uh, International Drive there, it's 300 feet high, two, you've done it, it's 300 feet high, and it's got 100 feet, goes high back here, right? And what you do is you, they strap you in a harness and you hang like this, and then that, the cable pulls you back 300 feet, that's 30 stories, by the way, 300 feet in the air, and you're hanging there head first, looking down, and the helicopter flies by, and that's what happened to me. The helicopter flew by. I was like, oh my goodness, I'm higher than a helicopter. And then you have to pull the ripcord and then you fall 150 feet and then it turns into this giant swing. So I take Josiah there and I'm like, okay, so you're gonna, you're gonna do this. You want me to go with you because you can do tandem. He goes, no, no, I wanna go by myself. I'm like, all right. And I'm thinking, it takes 72 seconds to get from the ground to the top. And the whole time you're looking straight down, you're going so high right? He's, I'm videoing him. He's so far up there. He looks, looks like a dot. And all of a sudden I see it release, boom. And he starts falling, free falling. And instead of being scared, he puts his hands back like this, falling straight down. And then when it turns into the swing, he goes into Superman. <laughs> and I'm, I'm videoing, he goes right over me, you know, like that. And I'm like, well, it didn't work. It didn't, he wasn't scared. He goes, no, it was fun, but it really didn't scare me. So maybe holding him upside down, but, but, but you probably should be scared of these things. That's what I'm trying to say. Strong faith comes from strong relationship. And God is desiring relationship with us for us to place our trust in him. Pentecost Sunday reminds us to trust God because he always fulfills his promises. This is the fulfillment of Shavuot, the day of Pentecost, 3,000 people saved. You can, read in, you can read the original Shavuot in Exodus chapter 32 and how 3,000 people died. Brings all this back around. And there are many traditions, ways that the churches remember Pentecost. A lot of times they have banners. They do things in red with you know, doves or flames of fire. But regardless of tradition, all agree that the purpose of the pouring out of the Holy Spirit the purpose of being empowered by the Holy Spirit with a variety of gifts is to be his witnesses. Acts chapter one, verse eight. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem in all Judea and Samaria to the ends of the earth. The purpose of the Holy Spirit and the gifts of the Holy Spirit is not for us to look spiritual. It's not to draw attention to ourselves. It's not so that we can look like something, right? It's the whole point is to be his witnesses, to draw attention to him. 
That's always, a, that's always a gut check. Like when we want God to move or we want the gifts of the spirit, we have to really check our heart. Why? Is it for our recognition and for our glory? Is it for his? It's to be his witnesses. This is the purpose. And the Holy Spirit gives us power to do this in a variety of ways. A couple of ways that I'm gonna mention here right now. One is he gives us power when we are weak. Man, sometimes it's hard to follow God, especially if we're doing it in our own strength and our own will and our own ability. It can be very difficult. And there are days I feel weak. And the Bible says that in the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We don't know how to pray, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through utterances that words could not express. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with God's will. The Spirit helps us in our weakness. It doesn't say the Spirit does it for you. It says the Spirit helps us in our weakness. I gotta do my part, right? Kind of like, you imagine like if you ever work out with a spotter, you know, and so you're trying to lift the weights and you're trying to push it a little further than maybe you actually have the strength to do and your spotter's right there behind you and just when you get to the point of failure, he steps in and and just kind of gives it a little lift. Doesn't do it for you, but just helps you. The Spirit helps us in our weakness and this makes us stronger. The Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness. A couple years ago, uh, a group of our church decided to go do the Tough Mudder in Orlando. And it's like a 12 mile run with 12 different obstacles along the way. And the difference in a Tough Mudder and the Spartan races is the Tough Mudder is you do it together. The motto is tougher together. Everyone finishes together. Right, And so you go through this and they have these crazy obstacles. Uh, electric shock therapy is one of them. You have to run through and the thing shocks you and you fall down, you know, and you laugh at other people that this happens to. And then one of them is called, you have to go into this, this really ice cold water. It's called the Arctic. Well, I better not say, but it's Arctic. It's cold. It's, it's, uh, it's really not a fun thing. Uh, <laughs> Am I right? <laughs> Those that were there. And I just, so we did this. I went, it was mostly young adults and teenagers. And there was a few of us older guys. Where's Joseph Rao? Is he here? Joseph Rao? He was, maybe he was in the first service, but Joseph was one of those guys and myself and, you know, we we're trying to hang in there. But here's what I learned in doing this Tough Mudder as I watched other teams do it. As they would get to certain obstacles that some people really struggled with, but their team would come around them and help them over or through that obstacle. And even at the end, I saw one team, two guys came up under one of the people on their team and just put them on their shoulders and carried them all the way so everybody finished together. Because in our weakness, right? This is the whole idea. This is, this is the imagery Paul's using. Is in, this is what the Holy Spirit does for us. He helps us in our weakness. It's the power of the Holy Spirit. And next week, we're gonna actually, in fact, let me just do a little pause here. Next week, we're gonna be talking about the power of the body. And you, you don't really, you don't wanna miss next week. Um, we're gonna talk about how strong we are together as a church, but even, even the larger picture of the church and what that means. And Pastor David Sheffield is gonna share a little bit of some of the things that he's been going through to give you an update and how all that ties in. So you don't wanna miss next Sunday because we're also, just like in the Tough Mudder, we're tougher together. We finish together. The Holy Spirit also gives us power to have hope in a hopeless world. Have you noticed that there's a lot of hopelessness in the world right now? There's a lot of fear, a lot of anxiety, a lot of chaos, and a lot of discouragement. People, a lot of people are really struggling to even find something they can be hopeful for. Paul tells Romans, Romans in Romans 15, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope, not just have hope, but overflow with hope. How? By the power of the Holy Spirit. It's something that we can't just do in ourselves. We can't just conjure it up in ourselves. Some people are naturally a little more hopeful than others, but this is beyond that. This is an overflowing hope that comes from the power of the Holy Spirit. And this is what he's saying. And and we live in a world right now that needs this. There are people all around us, including many of you that are walking through difficult circumstances that can really drain you of hope. The Holy Spirit gives us power to have hope in a hopeless world. The Holy Spirit gives us power to speak. We are called to be his witnesses. And we saw that happening in Acts chapter two. And I love this because this is Peter. Peter says, 
standing with the 11, lifted up his voice and addressed them, men of Judea, men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you, give ear to my words. So Peter is speaking this powerful message. Thousands of people's lives are changed. This is the same guy from the same mouth that was denying Christ and cussing out a little girl. And now God's brought him to this place where he stands up and speaks this out. The Holy Spirit gives us power to speak. That's something Peter didn't have at that moment when he was in fear. Now, after the resurrection and the power of the Holy Spirit, Peter stands up and with such conviction and such clarity communicates the gospel. Have you ever heard this statement, preach the gospel always and when necessary, use words? I got news for you. It's necessary. That's what preach means, by the way. Preach the gospel always and when necessary, use words. How do you preach? I get, this, I get the sentiment. The idea is that, hey, let your life preach the gospel. And I get that. Let people see something real in you, authentic in you, genuine in you that they're drawn to. But at some point, you got to open your mouth. And he will give us power to speak. You don't have to be something you're not. You don't have, and then don't be defensive. Don't be unkind. Don't be ugly. But speak truth. Speak it in love. The Holy Spirit will give you the wisdom to do that. He will give you the power to speak. So what can you do? What is it going to take? This Wednesday night, we're going to have a night of ministry. We're going to open it up. We're inviting all of you that want to come to do this. And we're going to have a night of ministry. We're just going to pray for you. We're going to lay hands on people to receive the Holy Spirit. We're going to pray for people that need healing in some way in their lives. We want to encourage you to come and be a part of this. We believe the Bible, and we're just going to do what the Bible says. This is not in your notes. Let me read this to you in Acts chapter 19. And it happened that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul passed through the inland country and came to Ephesus. There he found some disciples And he said to them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? Okay, this implies something. This implies that you can believe and have not received the Holy Spirit. That's why he asked them that. Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they said, no, we've not even heard there is a Holy Spirit. And he said, into what then were you baptized? And they said, into John's baptism. Paul said, John's baptism was a baptism of repentance, telling people to believe in the one who was to come after him, that is Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized in Jesus' name. And then Paul laid his hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit and began speaking in tongues and prophesying. So this is what Paul did. He laid his hands on them and just said, receive the Holy Spirit. That's what we're going to do. We're not, we're not going to try to manufacture what might happen, the results, the way that that's on the Lord. We're just going to be obedient to the word. Amen. And it looks different for every person. All of your own testimonies and the way you come to faith are all different. Some grew up in the faith and at some point the light comes on and you realize this is my faith. Others of you had no knowledge of God at all, but somewhere along the way, God revealed himself to you and you had a radical transformation and you gave your life to the Lord. Everybody's got different stories and it's the same when it comes to the Holy Spirit. But we're just gonna make space for this to happen. We're inviting you to come. Our elders are gonna be prepared. I'll be here laying hands on people just for you to receive this. Some of you, you know, you may be (laughs) spirit-filled. Sometimes I sound Southern. You may be, (laughs) stay with me, now it's a serious moment. You may be spirit-filled, but leaking. You know, actually, when Paul says be filled with the Holy Spirit, if you really study that out in original language, an accurate translation would be be being filled. Like it's a continual thing. Be being filled with the Holy Spirit. And we're gonna do this uh, Wednesday night and I'm gonna pray for those of you that might need healing in some way, standing together. And what you can do in that moment, if you can make it, or even if you can't make it even here today, there's three things you can do. One is trust God, not your mind. Proverbs 3 says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. We all know this. We've heard this verse, but we all keep leaning on our own understanding. We want to figure it out. We want to understand it. He says, don't do that. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he'll make your paths straight. 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 2 says, we impart this in words, not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the Spirit, 
interpreting spiritual truths to those who are spiritual. The natural person does not accept these things of the spirit of God. They are folly to him and he's not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. Paul's saying, these things are not something you work out in your head, they're spiritually discerned. Our, Our mind can be a barrier to our ability to receive from God. People often miss up on divine encounters because they're satisfied with what their mind can comprehend. So I wanna encourage you to trust God, not just your own understanding. Second thing is ask God, ask the father. Jesus said this, which of you fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Ask him. Get your head out of the way and ask him. God, I want all of you. I want to be as close to you as humanly possible. I want everything you have for me, God. Paul said, eagerly desire spiritual gifts. God, I want all the gifts you have for me. This, this week, my, myself and Jarrett and Kathy, we went down to go uh, sit with and have communion with Greg and Sarah Kearns and their family. And they got some news that they're, they're facing some really difficult circumstances with Sarah's health. And uh, I mean, it's a serious fight that they're in right now. And we went just to go sit with them and have communion together, pray together. There's a lot of hope, a lot of faith, a lot of peace. One of the things that I was reminded of as we were talking to Sarah is this story came to my mind. And it's a story of a little boy that was doing yard work with his father. And his father wanted to move this big stone out of the way. So the boy is trying to move the stone. He goes, I can't do it. His dad says, you're not using all your strength. Try again. I am too. Try again. He tries again. He goes, I can't do it, dad. He goes, you're not using all your strength. He goes, yes, I am. And his dad says, no, you're not. You haven't asked me and I'm part of your strength. Jesus said, ask the father. Ask the father. That's part of it is, is leaning into that. The last thing is to receive it by faith. <clears throat> receive by faith the gift of the Holy Spirit. Receive him by faith, the Holy Spirit. Jesus says, whatever you ask in prayer, you will receive it if you have faith. Faith is trust in and reliance on God. That's what we're talking about. That's what Luther was saying is above all things, trust God. Not your own understanding, not the wisdom of men, not the education of this world. There's good things to be learned from all those things, but we don't place our trust there above all things. We place our faith and our trust in God. Would you stand with me? We're gonna come to communion here in just a moment. And um, before we do, we're gonna take a moment to pray together. Listen, we all, we all have stuff in our lives that we're still working through. None of us are perfect. None of us you know, have it all together in every area. This is why we need the Holy Spirit to help us when we're weak, to help, help us continue to follow the Lord, and grow as a disciple. It's not about earning it. We can't. It's about receiving it by faith. And so I'm gonna lead us in a prayer and I just want you to open your heart before the Lord and you make this your prayer, uh, a surrender. We're gonna confess that we've all sinned. We're gonna confess Jesus as our savior and we're gonna request the Holy Spirit to fill us. And then I wanna encourage you, if you can, if you come Wednesday night and just be a part of that night of ministry. But you don't have to wait till Wednesday, you can receive right now. 
Let's just receive everything that God has for us right now in this moment. We believe that we encounter God in his word and that we wanna respond to that by praying this prayer together and, and then we'll also respond by coming to communion and remembering the gospel this way, that we are in right standing with God because of what he did, not because of what we do. Would you bow your hearts and just repeat after me? You make this your prayer though. Let's pray this together. Heavenly Father, I confess that I have sinned against you in my thoughts, my words, and my actions. Have mercy on me and forgive me through your son, my savior. Lord Jesus, I believe you lived on this earth. You died for my sin. You rose and now live. I receive you as my Lord. The Holy Spirit, fill me with power and passion to follow you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name. If you were encouraged by today's sermon, be sure to hit subscribe wherever you stream your podcasts. To experience other sermons, live services, and additional resources, visit us online at RedeemerPV.com.